Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, frequent flyers, wherever you're dialing in from today. Thank you for joining us here on The Lounge. Today, I have Lisa Jasser, a woman with metal drive and a passion for helping others. She is many things, and she does not let those things define her. She's a fellow self-mastery advocate, and today we're really going to be talking about deleting the adjective because they force you to play in a box. Lisa, thank you for being here with me today. Thanks for having me, Sarah. It's a real pleasure to um, talk about this because this is something that um, I've thought of often and the labels that we carry and the identities that we hold. So can you tell me a little bit more about Delete the Adjective? And you know, it's a book that you wrote a little bit more about what brought you to writing this and your own experience in taking away those things that we have often let define us. You know, I think the best way to describe Delete the Adjective is actually where the name of the book came from. Mm. Yes, it's about Ranger School. Yes, it's about being one of the first uh, three women to attend and ultimately graduate. But I had this immense honor of being invited by Mrs. Michelle Obama to President Obama's final State of the Union. Wow. And um, I got to sit in the um, president's wife's box and, and sit with her and, you know, 16 other of complete strangers that, that all got invited. And, um, I was able to bring a guest. And when I chose my guest, it was this amazing person. One of the first women to graduate from the United States military Academy back in 1980 woman by the name of Sue Fulton. She's a LGBTQ, um, before the IA plus yeah. advocate and she was running, um, this, or she was instrumental in this organization called Sparta that helped overturn uh, the ban on gays in the military or get rid of don't ask, don't tell. She also was very active in um, all things. She was one of the, she was the first gay marriage at the United States Military Academy. Um, just, just a really amazing mover and shaker. And it was really interesting because as a military service member who was invited to a political event, mm -hmm. at no point in time did I think of Sue the Sparta advocate or Sue the lesbian or Sue the this or Sue the... I never thought of any of that. I thought Sue, she's an activist. She's a mover and shaker. She's broken glass ceilings. She loves everything DC. Who better to have as my battle buddy? Because I don't understand politics. I don't understand DC. It's a different world. Right. So I invited her. And then this newspaper article comes out and it's all about this military service member, one of the first women. She could choose anyone. And she chose this and pile on the adjectives right. about two. And we're waiting in line going through security at the West Wing. And she looks at me and she's like, sometimes it's just not about the adjectives. And the phrase came out, delete the adjective. And yes. from that day forth, like I started tagging everything about, it's not about the adjectives. They mm. describe us. They don't define us. Mm. And so I got a lot of advice when I wrote the book saying, Hey, this kind of sounds like an English textbook. And I said, That's okay. Because for people like you, for people like me, for people who just want to be really amazing in their chosen industry, um, They'll understand that delete the adjective is just saying, hey, don't judge a book by this cover because this cover doesn't tell me everything. Yes, I love that. I really like that they describe us, but they don't define us. Yes. Because so often we create an identity around a word, you know, being a, a woman or a man or being in the military or being a pilot, you know, whatever that thing is. And then that's our identity. Yes. Uh, and that's also why for some people when that changes, they're, they don't know or are not aware a grieving process needs to occur because they've latched on so much that they're attached to it. So this is a really great way for people to play a little bit more, right? And yes. so that's what I like to say, play outside the box. It's, you know, we don't have to stay in the sandbox. We don't have to color in the lines. Well, and I think too, if you are focused on whether you call it identity politics or how you define yourself, the problem is we change and mature. I'm 45 years old. There is nothing that I believe today that I believed when I was 25, other than this is respect. I'm still a God fearing woman. But even that, I'm, I have a different relationship with my religion at 45, mother of two, married for, you know, I've been with Alan almost 20 years. 
very, very different than 25 year old Lisa <laughs> just graduated from college, living in Savannah, Georgia, maybe going out a little too late. Like you yeah. change, you adjust. And if you define yourself or if you put yourself too close in, into those boxes, too closed in, you, you don't allow yourself to change. You don't allow yourself to grow and adjust. Right. We become rigid in that identity. Um, like, like you, if you would have told me even just five years ago that now today I would have had short hair and like a blue mohawk and, uh, you know, doing all these things, I'd be like, what, what are you on? I'm sorry. Do you know who I am? Like, no, that's, that's not me. You know, at the time it was like very corporate pencil skirt, high heels, the whole hair and everything. And so, um, we're allowed to change. And I think it's about giving ourselves that permission and, and remembering, that, you know, the version of Lisa that you are with your partner versus when you're in mom mode versus when you're in military mode, you know, or speaker, business owner, friend, daughter, they're going to be different. Yeah. And they need to be. And, and a lot of times, um, I know you do, uh, keynote speaking as well, Sarah, but sometimes the audience doesn't need to hear from Ranger. Lisa Jaster. Sometimes I walk in and they hired me because I have this background story or I have a book that's about ranger school. And like, this is what we need. And you eat breakfast with your audience or you grab a cocktail the night before yeah. and you get on stage and you see the people not reacting to right. this militant person. That's not who they need. They need the mom or they need the teammate or they need somebody who can answer those really awkward questions that they don't know who else to address them to. Right. And, and so I truly believe you should always bring your true self, but you don't always have to bring your whole self. Mm. And if you want people to hear your message, whether it's with regards to delete the adjective and gender integration, or with regards to hiring based on merit or cognitive diversity or any of these other topics that we're going to delve into. If you want to bring your true self and really add to the discussion, the only way to do that is to make sure you're projecting in a way that the audience can receive you. Absolutely. Because we can bring the horse to water, but we cannot make it drink. And so we need to find the bridge. How do we bridge that gap and connect so that they feel seen and heard and then we also feel seen and heard, right? Because it's a, it's a two-way communication. And when, you know, people think, oh no, I have to try to put a mask on, right? In order to connect. No, it's the opposite. You take the mask off, but you bring the self that will connect rather than trying to force them to connect to something that they just cannot connect to. Right. Yeah. I love that. So now with delete the adjective, um, what has that really allowed for in your life when you started to kind of examine all of these labels that you held for yourself um, and then externally what other people might have kind of placed onto you? What, what was your experience like in, in going through that? A lot of times the, the boxes we put people in are the wrong boxes. So for me, I've been athletic since my youth. Now, granted, I was, I danced, I did ballet, tap jazz. I was the cheer captain in my high school. I played soccer, um, but then I decided to join the army. So who does that? Who goes from <laughs> ballet? I, who goes from toe shoes to combat boots? Right. And um, I mean, I know you've had a very similar journey. You can you can empathize at least. <laughs> yes. But who does that? And it doesn't make sense. And people were constantly telling me when I wanted to join the army, but you're a woman. Then you wanted to go to West Point. Well, they right. don't really, I mean, they accept women, but do they accept women? And and you got I got a lot of that feedback, but what people didn't know is deep down inside, I am an athlete. I love trying to do stuff that not that people tell me I can't do, but that I shouldn't be able to do. I like to climb in the woods. I like to hike. I like to be out there. I, I like to hunt. I like to fish. I grew up fishing. Now, when I went fishing with dad, I would take the sharpeners he had for the hooks and do my nails <laughs> but I was still out there having a great time. Yeah. And what I have found about delete the adjective and trying to uh, burn those barriers down is I've oscillated greatly, sometimes in a negative way, right? With the, with regards to, I need to be one of the guys 
Mm -hmm. And I lose a little bit of myself, meaning I'm not filing my nails. Right. Um, I'm just trying to be that fisherman and talk about stuff and scratch and itch and birch. <laughs> but that's not me either. So that's equally as false. Right. And what Ranger School and what these 20 somethings. So I was 37 years old, mother of two, uh, full time job. I was doing army part time when I went to Ranger School. All of my peers are the they average out about 23 year old males. And these are the people we're sharing foxholes. We're sleeping in the same barracks. We live yeah. together 24 seven, eat every meal together. And what I learned from them is that it is okay to be mom, Lisa, ranger, tough guy. It's okay to talk about the fact that the water moccasin isn't actually trying to attack you city boy. He's just following in your shadow because it's hot in Georgia. Right. So, you know, it's okay for me to know that while simultaneously knowing that if you put lotion on before you put camo on, the camo comes off easier. <laughs> like, it's, it's okay to be both of those worlds. So one of the great things for me is going to the school when I was so old, old in army terms, not old in reality, right. yes. um, but 37 years old versus these 23 year olds, they accepted me faster than I maybe accepted myself. Wow. They were willing to say, hey, it's OK for you to be a chick that's here while I was trying really hard to be one of the guys. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful. And that often goes to show how most of us putting others in boxes is our own projection. Right. And so in, in doing that, we kind of trap ourselves into what we assume others will be doing to us because we're doing that to others right. as well. So it's really re-examining our own relationship with, with our own definitions and, and how we can shift that and pivot the mindset to let it be a description and not a definition. And when I initially started down the path of doing public speaking, doing um, writing the book as well, the, the publishers and the editors that wanted to work with me all said, hey, we need this book for women to make them feel empowered. And, and what came about is women already are empowered. Sometimes the people who need to know that you're as tough as woodpecker lips, my, my favorite saying, the people that need to know that your heart is woodpecker lips aren't the other women. Like they've given birth, they've um, <laughs> dealt with the things that women deal with. They already know what women are made of. There's some guys out there that have very, very real biases for really well, good reasons. Like mm. when, when a guy comes up to me and he's like, oh, women didn't actually graduate ranger school. That was all just a political play. I'm not mad at them. I'm not mad at them at all because what have they been exposed to? What what is the typical female in their life like? And if they only know very gentle, nurturing women, good for them, but that's not me. So I really wrote the book. I really push in my speaking and in my discussions, the fact that not everybody is created equal. Men and women aren't created equal, but also women aren't created equal. And some of them want that very um, traditional relationship. Right. And some of them want a non-traditional relationship. Some of us want a traditional relationship at home, but I want to be non-traditional out in public. Like yeah. I want to make a lot of money. I want to work hard. I want to do all these things. But when I get home, I want to cook dinner and sit with my family and pour my husband a glass of wine before we sit down. Like yeah. I, it's okay to want all those things, but the book and my speeches are to try to introduce that level of diversity. Women are not necessarily fitting in any one group. So it doesn't make sense to put that adjective on with regards to the workforce. In this case, what makes sense is to look at what type of person are you? I love that. Yeah. And it's, it's so true. You know, there's, there's the, often a dichotomy of, you know, what people think it's like black and white and it's not, everything's a spectrum and depending on what season of life we're in and uh, you know, what level we are or how old we are, we get to sit on different levels of that spectrum based on our experience, our environment and our choice. And the more aware we become, 
the more we can choose what our experience will be like. Yes, definitely. Beautiful. So you touched on a little bit of the challenges um, that and the opportunity of being one of very few females at Army Ranger School. Well, what else would you say that you learned from that experience? Did was there anything else that that's a big highlight or um, that you you still kind of reflect on back today? More than the difference. Again, talking about diversity, more than the difference of men and women is there is a age gap. There is an age dynamic that people ignore because it's hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard when you look at the younger generation and you're the older generation and you're saying, hey, I worked with a company till I got the, the gold watch. Where is that loyalty? Where is the commitment? And you have people coming out of college where I'm often saying, hey, stay with your first job at least five years. You're not you don't even know what you don't know. You don't know what you want to be when you grow up unless you get knees deep into an organization. And yeah. people are saying, well, you know, three years is enough. I know enough three years and then I want to jump or I want to be in management or I want to do this. And so as an older person, it's really frustrating to work with younger people. And as a younger person, it's really frustrating to work with older people. Well, as a 37 year old dealing with people who had been in the army one, two, maybe five years, I'm looking at them going, they want the same thing as I do. Mm -hmm. They just go about it differently. So I was able to really switch my perspective because the diversity isn't the diversity of needs and wants. Everybody still has Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Am I safe? Do I have shelter? Do I have water? Do I have food? Okay, now I can start thinking about comfort. Everybody has those same things. It hasn't changed. It's just how we assess it and how we go about attacking it. So that's something I learned from, from being forced to live with all dudes, all about the age of 23 and being with them 24 seven, they want the same things I want. They just, they just execute the mission a little bit differently. Yeah. I love that. And also, you know, you can then see also the spectrum and the diversity amongst a group of males that's predominantly the average age of 23, how different they all are, right? Because we tend to stereotype and have a picture of what that would mean and what that personality and energy is like. And it's often, again, going to be very, very different amongst the different people that are involved. Um, And I love that you talked about the, the needs in Maslow's hierarchy. Obviously we need safety, right? And so psychological safety is really key, which is why Sue's work has been so important uh, for people in the military and, you know, the, the cognitive diversity and all the, the all the efforts that we have going on to make sure that people are understood, right? Neurodivergence is another one. Mm-hmm. Um, being able to communicate, and you know, sometimes we're saying the same thing, but we're just we're like this, yes. right? Yes. And so finding again that bridge helps us to, as you said, the core needs. Like we all want certainty in our life, and at the same time, we also all want variety and fun, and we want to feel significant. You know, a lot of times people, uh, I mean, anger is a tool to feel significant. We're not thinking that, but that's what can happen. Right. And we all want to grow. We all want to be part of a community. Nobody likes to be left out. Um, So it's it's important to recognize, you know, instead of trying to find the differences, find the similarities. I think that's ultimately what you're saying. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that that goes really to diversity and Diversity is one of my favorite topics to talk about only because when people talk about me being at Ranger School, they love to talk about my adjectives and that I'm diverse. Okay, well, um, I recently talked to a couple. He is a young sailor. He got sailor of the year for his um, major command. And he happened to be at Cheryl Sandberg. I'm not sure if you know who she is, but she's the founder of Lean In Org. So we were at a boat christening and we were eating dinner and Cheryl had this event. He was there. So he was a very dark skinned, tall, skinny black black man with a very short, very pale skinned white woman as his wife. And we started somehow down the topic of diversity, which of course was exactly inappropriate for a Friday night dinner, but Hey, that's, that's what I do. And I looked at him, I'm like, I bet you guys think you're a diverse couple. And she's like, yeah, have you seen us? I'm like, (laughs) who'd you guys vote for? And they both answered simultaneously last election. I was like, "Uh uh-huh. 
And, and I asked them something about parenting and I asked them something about academics and I asked them something about what they like to do on Friday night. And I'm like, how diverse are you? And they're like, oh my God, we were visually super diverse, but they were, they were a happily married couple that had very little diversity when it comes to cognitive diversity and even experiential diversity. They both grew up in downtown neighborhoods and big cities. So they had a lot of similarities in their background as well. And I said, the only thing that makes you diverse is you're tall and dark and you're short and light. And they're like, oh my God, anytime anybody slurs at us ever again, we're throwing this in their face. And I said, yes, please do. do." (laughs) I love that. And it's, I mean, it's great because again, you can't judge a book by its cover, right? And so we do make these assumptions when we see people, but you know, there's a nice little math equation of what, what you are when you assume, right. We both yes. are. Yes. And um, you know, this, this is such a important thing because it's, it's diverse experiences, diverse education, diverse belief systems, thought. I mean, I just saw a, a funny meme about um, you know, something about America and, and all these things that we have. And then the Europeans were like, don't email me. I'm on vacation until the end of August. You know, it was like this dichotomy. It's just what perspective are you looking at something from? That's all it is. There's not one that's better than the other because depending on who's making the decision, it will be better for some and better uh, worse for others, right? So what perspective can you adopt? And are you willing to let it be challenged and not met, let that make something neat, um, not let it mean something about you, right? I think yes. that is the most important thing. Because so often when somebody challenges us, what do we do? We get hot, we get embarrassed, we get flustered. But it's not that you're wrong. It's just different. Right, right. So it was about two years ago. I recently posted about this on LinkedIn, but I read Team of Ri- Rivals and it's... Um, a book about Abraham Lincoln and how he chose the people that advised him. Yes, I saw that. He chose all his frenemies, like all the people that he doesn't ne- didn't necessarily agree with, that he was going fisticuffs with during um, leading up to the election. After the election, when he was um, trying to get bills passed, the people who gave him resistance, those are the people he brought into his cabinet. And it was because it's important to it's important to respect the people you're talking to, but those diverse opinions, even descending opinions are what makes us think twice. When you're constantly yelling into a tunnel of your friends, you never, all you do is validate what you already believe. And then you don't get growth. Yes. Yes. And, and you can talk about in the military terminology, you can talk, talk about in your home life. If my husband and I agree on everything, are our children going to be free thinkers or are they going to go to college and spout whatever I said at home? So sometimes my husband will read the news and he'll take this point of view on an article and I'll come in and say, Oh, well, did you really think about it this way? And And he's like, you agree with me on this. And the kids will be like, oh, actually, my son asked me one time. He's like, mom, are you guys getting a divorce? I'm like, no, no, no. We're just we're just debating. And and it's real fun for me, because if you have those descending opinions, you know, using the Supreme Court terminology, then you can really see the balance. But if it's if it's always one way or the other, then then you have no room for thought or growth. Absolutely. I was on a podcast uh, panel recently and. It was such a fun experience because the two gentlemen that were with me were like diametrically opposed in terms of their belief and view on this topic. And we were able to have a very engaging and respectful rhetoric experience because they were passionate, but they weren't like finger pointing and being like, you're wrong and right. you know, demonizing the other just to try to prove a point, which I think is you know, most of us are not taught those skills, sadly, and we also don't understand our emotional experience. So we just defend. And yes. then that makes the other person react. And it just becomes this, again, a loop and a cycle we fall into. Um, and so taking playing devil's advocate, we, you can make it fun, right? And you can challenge your thinking. Because I mean, what smarter way to understand how you're perceived than to have people who will tell you that are actually on your team, even though they may not agree with everything that you say? Yes. I love that. Yeah. We don't know what we don't know. Right. Right. 
the more levels I get in my life, the more I realize I, I don't know that much. <laughs> when I was 17, I thought I knew everything, but now I'm like, uh. right. <laughs> Every year I find out I know less and less. <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I'm not looking forward to being 70 and knowing how dumb I really am. <laughs> right. Exactly. Then you're gonna be like, man, the whole time. <laughs> Amazing. So this is important for teams as well, because if you're just going to surround yourself with um, everyone who says yes to you, right, mm -hmm. or um, just thinks like you, then that's not very good for your business because you're going to go down this path that's very maybe narrow and, you know, you've got blinders on and you completely miss the point and the product doesn't sell or the service doesn't do what the clients expected, um, so I know you do a lot of work in this area. Can you tell me a little bit about what you've seen in teams that are not diverse versus diverse teams? Well, and it's not even the diver uh, it's not just the diversity. It's also that leader has to be open to diversity. So you can even have a team that's an extremely productive team, but as a leader, you shut down that innovation because it's not comfortable to argue. So I think the first step is really accepting the fact that no two people think exactly alike. And I'll use marriage because it's a super safe example. And my husband knows I talk about our marriage all the time. But, you know, we are happily married. We have been together 19 years. We still disagree on some of the same things we disagreed 19 years ago. And we're finding new things to disagree on. Hmm. But no two people agree on anything. anything. So if we wouldn't allow the other person to ex express their disagreeance, how could you ever move forward? Hey, I think, I think our kids should stay up till 10. Well, I think they should be in bed by nine. Okay, let's discuss it. Well, right. if you are the leader of the house and you're like, no, this is what I said, this is what's going to be done. How are discussions ever going to occur? So right. with the teams I work on, I, or the teams that I work with, I try really hard to start with the leadership and say, hey, what does disagreeing with the owner or the leader or the COO look like? Yeah. And can we find a way to professionally disagree with them where it doesn't become personal? And that goes back to the, Sarah, you communicate differently than I do. The point of this discussion is that I get my views expressed. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to speak to you in a way you can hear me. There's a great book. I obviously love ingesting books called Crucial Conversations. Oh, I recommend that to everybody. <laughs> yes. yes. I can't tell you how many copies I bought, but the, you know, the underlying notion of the book is, are you trying to win an argument or are you trying to get your point across? Again, going back to the family, I want to go to Peru more than anything. Well, my husband only likes to travel to hunt. Like that's his goal. So we both want to travel. So if I want him to go to Peru with me, I've got to figure out a way to hunt or fish or do something right. hyper-masculine there, not just <laughs> climb a mountain or go for a hike or go see some churches or go see some ruins. I've got to find that. So in the crucial conversations world, I've got to communicate what I want to him using terms that make sense to him. So yes. not a direct example, but, you know, I don't want to ruin the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's definitely that's for the last decade. That's the number one book that I've recommended to everybody. Now, the second book I've been recommending, which I just told you about before we went live, it is Surrounded by Idiots by Thomas Erickson. Um, if you would like to understand yourself better and have better awareness of how others perceive you in addition to what you think of yourself, and how to communicate with other personality types. That is one of the best books you will come across and you'll be laughing. Yeah. Uh, but I really love the point you made about, are you trying to win an argument or are you trying to get a point across and, and have that clarity and, and connection on just understanding of that point? Because I can tell you from my relationship with my mother that as soon as I stop trying to be right all the time and just like, I, even if I knew I was wrong, like even if I knew this path was like, no, I actually don't even agree with what I'm saying, but I had to win the argument. Yes. Right. Yes. And, you know, and then I, you know, we both of course just blow up at each other. And now I realize like, wow, I didn't actually care about the point I cared about winning. And when I removed that all of a sudden I was like, man, it could have been easy like this the whole time. Right. The whole time. <laughs> oh, growth. 
growth is so fun. It has to be my third decade to figure that out, but yes, that's, yeah. that's part of life. So in my coaching, we use something called Hogan's. Um, so I'm Hogan certified. It's probably very similar to the book you're, you're mentioning, but it talks, it looks at different types of people and how they behave and perform. So, um, specifically with Hogan's it's broken down into three different, um, areas. One is what's your motivators? What do you like on a good day? And then what do you like on a bad day when you don't manage your bad behaviors? Mm. And, and those are kind of the three assessments that get spit out and going back to talking about working in a diet. Hmm, I don't even want to say working in a diverse environment, but working in a, an accepting environment mm. where other people can share their ideas is if your motivators are, let's say you're very altruistic, like you just like to do good things for good people. Well, I want to do good things for good people as long as I make a lot of money doing it. So our motivators might be juxtaposed, or if we both believe the same good things are the same good things, then we can get to the same end state. We just we just attack it differently. Hmm. So again, if you have a team, like again, in my coaching, I'm like using Hogan's and I look at a team and everybody on the team has different motivators. Okay. Well, where is there some consensus? Where can we drive that? Or do you know that the other people on your team have different motivators? He's right. about to retire. So he, he needs to be a little less risky in his decision making. I'm new in my career. If I lose this job, I'll just go get another entry level job. So yeah. we are automatically, there's, there's that generationalism or that ageism gap. We automatically have different motivators. And if we don't understand that, we can't necessarily drive, um, drive to the same end state. But once we can comprehend that we're, we're even motivated differently, then we're looking at, uh, then we, then we can look at the, diversity that will be brought into the discussion or, or the different points of view. Yeah. Motivating factors is really huge to understand because, um, when you know those things, then you can also have better crucial conversations Yes, and it's, you know, a lot of people just try to like throw money at the problem. That's not going to solve the problem. That's usually a band aid, yes. and the underlying issue is still there, which is why you get the, the repetitions and the cycle of constantly hiring the same type of person or constantly having a certain dynamic issue. So it's really important to understand how people tick. Um, what's the best way to communicate with you as a leader? Right. right. One of my friends actually on the weekend told me, he said, I actually had to write something and send it to my team so that they could understand how it's best to work with me and that I'm not going to send them a voice note back. I'm not going to put emojis in my texts and no, I'm not mad at you. Right. And so, you know, but he had to clearly define it so that they could have that safety to yeah. understand this is just a communication difference. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I have told some of my older leaders at one point in time, Hey, come and see me text to a 25 year old is a, oh, is the equivalent so of going to the principal's office. Yeah. So you might not like emojis, but go ahead and put that smiley face on there so that they know they're not in trouble. Like it's okay. It yeah. feels wrong in your forties to use <laughs> smiley face emojis, but it's okay. It's okay. We can try new things, right? Yeah. It's like ice cream. You don't have to do it forever, but you can try a new flavor every now and again. Yes, yes it is. Amazing. Okay. So Lisa, I would love to ask you, what do you think your superpower is? I don't get embarrassed. Okay. Like, like it is really hard to embarrass me, which, nice. which allows me to be open and honest. So yeah. if I'm talking about deleting the adjective, if I'm talking about building a diverse team, if I'm talking about, um, if I'm coaching someone, it's a lot easier for me to talk about my failures because I feel my failures have led to my successes. Right. Therefore I am not embarrassed about the bad things I've done before or the mistakes I've made or the missteps I've had. Um, same is true in working out. Like I don't mind failing a lift or pushing too hard or, or completely bonking at a race, any of that stuff. I feel like it's a driver to my long-term success yeah. So I think my superpower is being okay, more okay than most um, with regards to making a fool of myself. 
That's a great superpower. I'm sure a lot of people are, would, it would be in agreement like, man, I wish I could have that. I mean, th it's funny the things that embarrass us, right? You know, yeah. I, I had a experience just yesterday where I was on the, the call, a call with my bank and I had this like moment, I didn't recognize it as it was happening, but as soon as we hung up, I was like, oh, I was feeling embarrassed, right? And I was trying to kind of show why this mistake had happened and, and it, why it wasn't a big deal, but really it's not a big deal and, right. you know, it's fixed and now I know, so I don't do it again, right? Yeah. Um, but yet there was this like level of embarrassment there. And so once we can start to become aware of that, then maybe we can have more of your superpower. <laughs> I will tell you that my 14 year old son and my 11 year old daughter would love for me to be a little bit more embarrassed once in a while. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay. Uh, my second question I have for all the guests is who is on your personal board of directors? I think that one's the easiest. And I think you could probably list it for me based on what I've said, my husband and my kids, um, my family, I'm one of eight children. So I, one of the benefits of being one of eight children is that there is diversity in any large group and yeah. I can literally call someone different in my family and get completely different advice. So yeah. I would say my family is, is really my key board of directors more than anything else. I love that. And you know what? I love that you said your children because very often we forget that they also have wisdom because they're not, I don't want to use the word tainted, but they're not jaded. They're not conditioned. They're not in the box yet. And so sometimes that were, that perspective is what we need to pull us out of whatever loop that we're in yes. and, and treating them with that respect as well, because they are sovereign beings rather than like, Oh, I know best because I've lived 37 years. Well, they also are in a new environment than when you were that age. So being a two way street and having them advise you is really, really, really beautiful. Yes. My son said something great the other day because I was talking about the book. Hey, I want to advertise more. What, it, what do you think I should do? And he goes, whatever you do, never get a billboard. Billboards are the dumbest thing unless it's for Bucky's and or a bathroom. <laughs> like food, drink, gas station. That's the only time you should ever use a billboard. I'm like, okay. Never thought about it, but okay. Yeah. I get, yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Or if you, um, you know, you're a lawyer for somebody who's been in an accident, I guess that's the only other type of billboard that I've ever noticed. But if you even look, if you look at cars driving down the street, who is looking up? Only the driver. Right. So the, is the driver reading the billboards? Nine times out of 10, no, they're driving. And exactly. the passengers are no longer staring out the window. They've got something keeping them busy. Yeah. Just a really good um, piece of advice from a 14-year-old. Yeah, I love it. That's great. Um, okay, so now the third question, how do you best serve or represent humanity? This is definitely the hardest one, um, but I think it ties first, uh, very well into the first answer. And that's by not being ashamed or embarrassed easily, I can answer some questions that most people can't. And I worked in the oil and gas industry. I actually worked as a um, construction engineer. So I, um, I've got a civil, I've got a master's in civil engineering. So again, my entire life from being an army engineer to um, going to ranger school, to working in the oil and gas industry, to working construction and project management, I've always been one of very few females. And so people would feel comfortable asking me things that they either wouldn't ask my male peers because right. of the male to male interactions, um, yeah. or they wouldn't feel comfortable asking their wives. Yeah. And it, it was never, well, every once in a while, I was a little too personal, but as a whole, it wasn't too personal. It was just something that's hard to ask someone. Yeah. But um, so the way I add value to society best is by being an open book. And if somebody said, asks me an uncomfortable question, I am comfortable enough to say, Hey, that's a, that's a little too far, or let me answer that, or let me answer it in a hypothetical because I don't want to expose my personal life that much. Right. That's beautiful. And that's, you know, and that's something that we need. Um, and again, it's, it's that creating of safety, right. And, and that, why it's important to have diverse relationships, both male and female. I mean, we all have masculine qualities. We all have feminine qualities, but to be able to communicate in that way, if they didn't have sisters or if they didn't have girlfriends, 
how are they, how else are they going to know how to communicate or understand or, um, you know, be able to ask a question and not get mocked because in that industry, just like in aviation and aerospace, it's very masculine, very dominant. Uh, and we're, we're kind of shedding a lot of those mindsets right now. We're in this, this switch and as humanity, we're, we're evolving those mindsets, but it's also really important that the women don't come or we don't become overly masculine in our approach, which can happen, right? We pendulum swing. And it's also important that we, um, can stay connected and, and recognized. So I think being present uh, is also how you serve because you're able to see the question underneath the question. Right, right. Beautiful. Well, Lisa, thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I'm sure we could go on for hours. Um, if our listeners would like to get in touch with you or learn more, what, where can they um, find out more about Delete the Adjective and, and you? The very easiest way is to go to deletetheadjective.com. It is my website and it has all the hyperlinks to my socials. Um, I do go to the comments section. There isn't a single thing that I post where I don't read the comments. Um, every once in a while, if all you post is like a smiley face on my thing, I might, I might not respond to it, but I do, whether it's LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, the artist formerly known as Twitter, now X or Facebook, I am, I am there. I am present. I do only check it in the morning and the evening to, for my own sanity. But I love, I love getting into the comments section. I love getting into discussions and debates. So delete the adjective.com is the way to find me. All right. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you everyone who's joined us live today. If you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and put those in the comments on whatever platform you're watching this from, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. We'll see you soon. Thanks.